Welcome to Live Talks, a podcast by Live, a tech and logistics company headquartered in Abu Dhabi. On Live Talks, we tackle fintech, logistics, business, and best practices in the workplace. I'm Karim Bakhash, the VP of Strategy at Live Global, and I'll be your host. Some of our largest e-commerce partners in many of the GCC markets, for instance, are actually governments. Mm. So something like Smart Dubai is actually, for instance, for, for your benefit, it's the largest e-commerce merchant that we have today in the country. I think everyone is in e-commerce now. You cannot be in commerce if you're not in e-commerce. So if you look at like, you know, nowadays trends, and I don't know how much of a trend it still is, but BNPL, you BNPL, know, yeah. Web3, um, you know, uh, all these things are, are great examples of technologies that are kind of booming, but they will quickly also bust and find their feet and, and either find relevant use cases and be able to be or to remain sticky in the life cycle and the journey of a, of a customer or just fall flat. When you look at the GCC and MENA market of fintech, you always find a very strong player in each country, but that player is not at all strong in another country. And you'll see that more so, more so clearly in banking. Which bank exists as a dominant force in one market is also a dominant in another market. Very rare. And that tells you that that these, these states are basically protective of their economies, which is a natural stance. Welcome to a new episode of Live Talks. Today's episode is about payments and fintech. Here with me today is the regional GM of MasterCard for GCC and uh, Pakistan, uh, JK Khalil if you want to introduce yourself a bit before we continue. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so um, my, I, I think I, the, the easiest way for me to present myself is to say the first 10 years were in technology and the second 10 years were in banking and, and, and eventually fintech. So kind of gone full circle from being a software developer to being a technology consultant, then found my way uh, after business school into banking, um, you know, in the UAE and, and, and UK, uh, first doing chief of staff, then a bit of capital markets. But more interestingly, later on, got called by the dark side, joined uh, Booz and Company, spent four and a half years until, uh, until uh, you know, the partners decided to, to, to sell it off to PwC. And then um, that's where, fortunately, I got approached by MasterCard to come in and manage their regional advisors business, which is their consulting and data analytics business, where we help our largest partners, whether they are banks or governments or merchants. Uh, really uh, flesh out their strategies, uh, identify relevant uh, target segments with the with the you know match them with the right value propositions, and then help them with the go to market and execution. So I did that for about eighteen months until I was asked to go in and manage Saudi Arabia as a market. Then Saudi became Saudi Bahrain, Saudi Bahrain Levant, and earlier this year I was asked to manage the region of GCC Pakistan, which we call MENA East in our parlance. So that sums about. Pretty much twenty years of uh, of career between uh, you know my start as a software engineer in Lebanon all the way to uh, working for Mastercard. Great to have you here. Thank you. Um, so maybe just a bit of intro, right? Digital payments, fintech is at the heart of every discussion lately. I mean, especially if you're operating in e-commerce and delivery and foods, uh, where we operate as live, uh, everybody needs to use a form of digital payments. Um, I was looking at some of the numbers last night, and this industry seems to be growing at exponential rates. So just for some kind of general info, like globally in 2022, they're expecting 8.5 trillion. That will grow to 15.7 trillion in 27. So another stellar growth for the next years. That is the same thing in the GCC, um, 92.5 billion going to 168. So we see the same growth. Uh, so it seems to be an industry everybody wants to be in. Um, including us, right? Everybody talks about being in fintech. Uh, even the companies that were nothing to do with fintech suddenly are acquiring fintech companies because they want it to be at the heart of what's going on. Uh, and that's why I would like to have this conversation with you and ask you some interesting question. Being from MasterCard, of course, you, you have a lot of perspective on what's coming up and what's happening. So maybe one first question is uh, the increase of e-commerce, right? This has been exponentially increasing in the last few years. Obviously, with, with COVID, uh, that even pushed it to another extreme. Um, how do you see this? How, how is this impacting digital payment? And, and where do you see this going, of course? Yeah, a great question. I think, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, to your point, if I look at just uh, the sheer force of adoption that's been created through the pandemic, 
I mean, I think if I look at the numbers from 2020, we were talking about just four and a half trillion dollars worth of global e-commerce uh, consumer spending. And today that's double that. And in the future, it's 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 doubling basically every two years almost. I mean, or, or adding two to three trillion dollars globally every two to three years or less. Uh, and I think that's only gonna gonna accelerate actually. So we're not on a slowing trajectory, we're on, we're on an incremental sort of exponential trajectory. And I think the reason for that is simple. Today, in a digital kind of economy, if you're doing commerce, you're doing e-commerce. And even if you are only a brick and mortar shop, if you have not uh, set up a digital presence and you don't have an omni-channel presence to deliver through channels uh, seamlessly across you know, tablets and phones and laptops, primarily smartphones to be honest, but across the whole gamut of channels, then you're missing out more than a trick or two. And, and I think to your point, um, all merchants and all players of all sizes have realized that, even governments today. So some of our largest, will you believe it or not, some of our largest e-commerce partners in many of the GCC markets, for instance, are actually governments. Mm. So something like Smart Dubai is actually, for instance, for, for your benefit, it's the largest e-commerce merchant that we have today in the country. Very interesting. Yeah. So, so you can just imagine the sheer adoption that's happening. And it's, for me, it's, it's much less about commerce versus e-commerce. I think everyone is in e-commerce now. You cannot be in commerce if you're not in e-commerce. I think that's a simple version of it. And, and that also is, is, is the way that we have started thinking about our technology stack, right? So in any discussion that we have, uh, across all of our partners, banking, merchants, governments, um, I refer to it as the as the payments matrix. Right, you okay. cannot be just focusing on one form factor of payments or one channel. It is basically, if you're a merchant, you have to be able to be omni-channel. You have to create choice in terms of which um, you know means of payment. What is your payment method? Are you paying with the wallet? Are you paying with the card? Are you paying with a remittance? Are you paying P2P? Are you splitting a bill? So this is what I call a form factor. Uh, you know, are you paying, uh, you know, now and buying, uh, you know, uh, now, or are you buying now and paying later? So yeah, the NPL. Yeah, so yeah. all these form factors, all the channels, right, and all the partners. So government, merchant, banks, wallets, fintechs, etc. So this is for me like as a three-dimensional, the multi-rail matrix that we're now all playing and kind of, you know, navigating. And if you cannot navigate that matrix as a business, you're missing out on a lot, and your competitors are probably doing it already. I think live is a fantastic example of that, by the way. Uh, you guys have like kind of gone into uh, delivery and then you're into channels. Now you're into the payments part of it and you're trying to automate procurement with payments. So I think you are a perfect example of how businesses are realizing that you have to be a platform and you have to offer an end to end service and you cannot just truncate the experience because if you do, you're leaving a lot of money on the table and probably somebody like a fintech typically will come in Correct. and plug that journey Correct. or experience gap. Correct. Um, I think that is the kind of complexity that I see happening. And it is kind of, in a way, refreshing to see many of the new players getting it and new business models and businesses being built, like Live as an example, to basically cater to this new complexity and this new matrix of payments. I feel like some of the traditional players are still trying to find their feet, but I think they will quickly be able to either build or, or, or acquire some of the capabilities. Um, and, uh, and I think you know, as as this payment matrix kind of evolves and develops and grows, there will be even more opportunities for fintechs to come because as complexity grows, opportunities and gaps also of get course. created of course. and entrepreneurs will come and close them and create more value, whether it's on the experience side, whether it's on the value side, value added to service size and so on and so forth. And and I totally agree with what you said. I mean, all companies are trying to to be a part of this matrix that you're talking about and growing uh, at Live, we're trying to do that, as you as you rightly mentioned. Um, how do you see then technology, like your perspective as a payment technology company? Like, how do you? Which new te technologies and trends are having the biggest impact now? Like, is there something that's happening today that you see has a very big impact? And certain things are might happening in the near future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I don't think there is one particular technology that is dominating, except the fact that I think there is an acceleration of everything. Okay. And um, what we're seeing is basically shorter innovation cycles. So you're seeing booms and busts um, in innovation much quickly, right? So we saw the rise of tokenomics and, and crypto, and then now it's kind of like having an existential moment. How Correct. will it exist? Why will it exist? Who's going to adopt it? What is it going to be used for? 
Um, I think equally, you know, wallets had a, a, a sort of a great moment and now it's kind of going into every direction. Everyone wants to have a wallet. Merchants want to have a wallet. Uh, you know, banks want to have a wallet. Fintech wallets want to have a wallet. You know, every Tom, Dick and Harry, a, 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 you know, a, a transit player wants to have a wallet. So everyone is now thinking of wallet. And I think what they're really trying to say is, we want to exist digitally, we want to store value digitally, mm. and we want to be relevant in other use cases non-core to us digitally. That means if I'm a transit player, why not also sell you, I don't know, entertainment tickets so mm. that you can buy your um, you know, your your ride and you're also bundling it with an entertainment, whether it's um, you know, a, a movie ticket or a, a concert or a theater ticket, whatever that is. Uh, so I think that acceleration and interlinkage between technologies and use cases, I think, is what's accelerating. Obviously, this is facilitated by APIs, which I think is a huge technology which will also accelerate open banking, open data, open finance. So I think these are interesting spaces that are about to kind of also emerge and are trying to find their feet in the new kind of uh, uh, more complex payments uh, and commerce matrix. Um, and I think there's always going to be like, you know, these pockets of, for instance, if you look at like, you know, nowadays trends and I don't know how much of a trend it still is, but BNPL, you BNPL, know, yeah. Web3, uh, you know, uh, all these things are, are great examples of technologies that are kind of booming, but they will quickly also bust and find their feet and, and either find relevant use cases and be able to be or to remain sticky in the life cycle and the journey of a, of a customer or just fall flat and, and people move on very quickly. I, I, I've noticed this in the latest news. Every time I open news about a new round of funding, especially lately, it's always been a fintech company. Yeah. And it's always about a wallet, a BNPL, a version of it, a combination or something in between. And, I, and I'm thinking, okay, all these at some point are going to have to consolidate or someone is trying to figure out which was the best unique economic out there because yeah. there's a lot of them doing almost the same thing. Absolutely. I think, um, and I don't want to sound like I'm a skeptic. I'm generally a skeptic, uh, disclaimer. But I, think, um, but I think what will happen is um, and, and this is a typical Middle East thing, right? Where we see a couple of huge trends in the US and then suddenly you find like a slew of followers in the Middle East, which is great because that means we're, a, we're a, um, I don't know what you want to call it, a population or, or a region where we know how to copy and actually sometimes we copy better and we know how to localize, example Correct. with Kareem, right? Correct. Uh, uh, Souk and, and Amazon. Um, but also uh, I think we we are increasingly becoming better at making mistakes, which is great because otherwise there would be no VC industry, right? You have to kind of fund as many ideas and innovators as possible for new ideas to emerge and then for some of them to fall flat and the others to, to really succeed. But I think to your question uh, on which ones will stay and which ones will not, I think, yes, there is now a flurry of activity. Much of it will have to quickly mature and understand the differences between the landscape in the US market, where you have like 350 million captive consumers and a very liberal regulator, and coming to GCC and have, you know, six regulators, if you want to look at GCC, or look at Middle East or MENA, where yes. you have, I don't know, 20 regulators, and good luck getting one thing built that can be rolled easily or passported Correct. into another market. Correct. So as a market, if MENA does not become more regulatory harmonized, from a regulatory perspective rather, if it doesn't become more harmonized and, and from a regulatory perspective more uh, uh, facilitative as a, as a platform for fintechs to grow, especially I say fintechs, not much less other startups, right? because fintechs obviously because of the fin part has, has higher uh, barriers to from a regulatory perspective, it's gonna be very hard. And so long as we solve for that regulatory piece, which is not very straightforward because it has a lot of you know, political, local, regional, et cetera, dynamics linked to it, it will be hard for someone to come and say, I have a wallet, so I'm going to build a fintech and I'm going to roll it out into the three, four, yeah. large, you know, five largest markets Correct. and it's going to be fine because it is not so straightforward. So I think to your point, which models will be easily passportable, which ones will be easily scalable within one or two markets at least so that they can survive the lag it takes to roll out through multiple markets? Which ones will be relevant use cases? Which ones will they find the right customer segment? Will it be the same as in the US or slightly different? I think there's a lot of question marks to be asked and hard for anyone, I think, with you know without a crystal ball to guess. So uh, so yeah, for me, the jury is still out there. FinTech is not an easy uh, space to crack, Mina. And I think um, we will find many more uh, cycles of, uh, of boom and bust before we can say what are the clear winners, especially in fintech. And, and, and to your point, right, when you look at the GCC and MENA market of fintech, you always find a very strong player in each country, 
but that player is not at all strong in another country and exactly. and they some of them try to go from one country to another but it takes a lot of effort and you will see that more so more so clearly in banking which bank exists as a dominant force in one market is also a dominant in another market very rare and that tells you that that these these states are basically protective of their economies which of is course. a natural stance right of so course. you want to protect and facilitate your banking champions to be the largest sort of providers in your market but the second they go to another market you know doors get closed restrictions on number of branches what you can do the license and so on and so forth where i think it's much more interesting and i don't think there's many doing that and again it sounds a bit cheeky but again live is a good example is the b2b side of it because while b2c is highly regulated right consumer business is highly regulated b2b business is much less regulated so, for instance, going and building a procurement platform that uh, facilitates B2B payments between buyers and suppliers. That is a model that you don't need a lot of regulatory you know, uh, hoops to jump through in terms Correct. of getting it rolled out across markets. Correct. Now, there are, I would say, more than a handful of fintechs trying to do that, for sure. Look at the Caso, the Retailo, you know, all mm. these guys, uh, Penny in Saudi Arabia. They're trying to do that. And the proof in the pudding for me is how fast can they roll out to new markets? And many of them are also use case based. So one guy will focus on, let's say, Horeca, hotels, re- restaurants, Correct. cafes. Another one will focus on, let's say, TradeLink will focus on trade flows or like, you know, import export. Another guy, retailer, will focus on retailers. So how quickly they can go from a native or, or, or captive use case into multiple use cases and how quickly they can roll out across a few, a few big markets. I think that will be a good proof point. And I think whoever, cracks that first will probably have a better chance at raising money and consolidating the market. But then to, to I mean, just thinking about it, right? So is a fintech company really scalable then on a global scale? Because I'm also thinking, uh, I'm looking also at certain cultural differences between mm. regions, right? If you go east to South Korea and Japan, the way they treat payments in China is very different than what we do here, which mm. there's still a part of cash business here that goes on because we see it also in our, yeah. there's a lot of still cash, less and less, it used to be very, very strong. And then in the US it's completely different. Africa, very high use of digital mobile payments uh, that we don't see in other parts. So can you scale as a fintech company? Then? That's a great question. I don't know what the answer is to this question. Actually, I have to think about it a bit. But let me just try to break it down to you in, into two maybe different paths that you can follow. Um, first of all, what is a fintech company? Good question. Let's start there. I mean, MasterCard is a fintech company. We're the OG of fintechs, right? Of we were set up 60 years ago only to run a transaction between a merchant, an acquirer, and an issuing bank. Correct. That's about it. Was that scalable? Heck yeah. Now, let's look at another kind of fintech. If we're talking about this B2B fintech we just described, it doesn't matter what, method, what payment method is running to support the payment between the supplier and the buyer. But I think it's pretty scalable. Right. Why is nobody doing it? I don't know. Maybe those who are doing it in large markets are focused on large markets because there's so much juice to extract. And B2B is kind of one of those kind of, you know, mega nova stars of value or, or of opportunity that we haven't even like scratched the surface off. So I totally appreciate why one or two players could be focusing on US, could be focusing on Europe, very large, sizable markets again, and not doing it here. But I think this is a scalable thing. Now, if you talk about a wallet, yeah, I'll tell you, it's very hard. Yeah. And because wallet obviously in Korea versus China is different, let alone, you know, in that part of the world. So let alone how it, how it compares to here versus anywhere else. But what I, what I do can tell you is that commerce is scalable and and financial transactions are local in nature. So I think more about it as, I mean, I mean, in the future, I don't think we're gonna be talking about FinTech to be very clear. Okay. And I'm talking about like three to five years. Okay. Because financial technology is a backbone to any commerce transaction. So even right. at MasterCard now, we talk about the future of commerce. We don't, no longer talk about future of payments. Right. Payments will become invisible in the end, right? Correct. It doesn't matter where, it depends on where you are. It doesn't matter how you're paying because there's always a local payment method. And there's always a cross-border payment method. So if you are living in UAE, whatever the dominant ecosystem is that allows you to pay out of whether it's a card, if it's a credit or a bank account, if it's a debit, to a merchant or to a you know, P2P to another uh, person, is going to be very different than how it's going to run in the US or in China. But it's going to exist. Payments are very local. When you travel, you're probably using a card because Correct. 
Be, let's face it, cross-border payments is a disaster yes. and only you know a couple of giants have figured it out. Of course. But fintech will no longer exist as a term because in my mind, any commerce, any business who does commerce will just ride on the utility of payments right. and provide an experience. And right. in most experiences, pay, like in Uber, payments are invisible. We call them invisible payments. Because yeah, when you pay happens. in Uber, yeah, you just get out of the car and, and pay. Exactly. So. so that will continue and that will grow and, and people will just take it as granted. Exactly. I mean, you just do it. You just, exactly. The same point as uh, going to grocery and just go, going out of the store. Amazon without, Go. There you yeah, go. Yeah, Amazon. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's what we call. Okay. Good. Now, if, if with, with all these tech and systems improving and expanding, how do you stay at the forefront of innovation and how do you collaborate with fintech companies? Look, I think we're no different than many of the global technology giants in the sense that um, we believe that innovation is is a um, <clears throat> innovation is better left to its own devices and markets, meaning that we believe that instead of us trying to build the future of whatever payment is you know relevant in the local market or regional market, we think that innovators and entrepreneurs can do that. So our focus is actually to partner with them. So that's okay. the first thing that we do. We go out and partner with fintechs. We partner with and all kinds of fintechs, right? All the way from SME, B2B, B2C, you know, and all the way down the chain across uh, value-added services that are not even payments. So to give you an example, we have a huge cybersecurity practice. Okay. It's not about payments, but it's about securing the environment of commerce, right, and e-commerce. So we have a huge partnerships, um, and we've done many acquisitions, I think over $2, 3000000000 billion of acquisitions on the cybersecurity side over the last five, 10 years. Um, same thing in terms of uh, partnering with innovators that invent new or, or you know, or, 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 or successfully build new forms of payment, like account to account, for instance. We've had, uh, we've done two, three very large acquisitions, I think nearing $2 billion in terms of building an account to account ACH type of, uh, of a payment, a payment trail. Uh, hard to scale to your earlier point, but it's a great way to also be able to facilitate local payments in certain environments and certain markets and economies where it, where, where economics are super uh, low and, and quite depressed and thin, thin margins. So partnership is key. And I think that's the first thing that we do. We establish, we talk, for, for instance, when we have an, a focus on open banking, we go and partner with open banking players, okay. understand what they're doing, how we can add value to them. As a secondary step, we may decide to invest. We may decide to completely ingest, uh, you know, a few of the successful players, especially if they're late stage. And that's the, I think, the power of our platform. I think you've heard of it called StartPath. So StartPath is a global engagement platform, right? Okay. Where we kind of invite all startups, especially later stage, more commercial kind of Series B, Series T, C, sorry, uh, kind of uh, startups to come and partner with us. Uh, engage with us, open up their technology. We can help them with the review of technology, quality assurance, and so on. We can also advise them on some of the assets that they would need to be able to access our 25 or 30,000 global uh, banking partners. Okay. So the first thing is, let us, let us kind of get into a partnership to understand each other. It could be a commercial, it could be just a purely strategic partnership through StartPath. We get to expose them to our banking community and they get immediate feedback. You know, what are the use cases that work? Which, which regions would this thing work? Which regions uh, wouldn't make sense and so on. And then eventually, if some of them do well, um, we, we do consider uh, investments, whether it's a strategic investment or a full on acquisition. OK. Um, and I think that is how we, we have expanded our uh, MasterCard, let's say, product and solutions shelf from just the traditional core yeah. where we started to now having, I don't know, over I'm not going to put a number on it, but like a significant number of products and solutions across the gamut of commerce. I, I, I was also surprised, I mean, surprised when I went on the, lately on the website yeah. and I was said, wow, okay, these guys are doing much more than what we think MasterCard used yeah. to do, uh, which is good, which means that they're expanding their product and services where things are growing, where things are, are developing. And, and that's, that's the core of, of, you know, anything related to financial services now, Absolutely. right? You have to continuously innovate and continuously go into new things. Um, I was not aware of that platform you're talking about, but it's interesting. Yeah. A lot of companies are doing this now, especially in their sectors, where they try to create this environment for startups to grow, be exposed, and then at the end you either acquire them or ingest them Correct. or whatever you want to do with them. Uh, but that's a good. Maybe we talk a bit about these kind of value-added services that yeah. we talk. Like, I mean, we mentioned a bit BNPL, which seems to be the sexy world in the market. Uh, I remember a company, I think, in the U.S. called Affirm, which is the, the biggest one doing that. Um, and then, obviously, crypto, which, you know, used to be very, very 
talked about until lately all the events that happened, which is everybody's rethinking what now do we do? Um, and maybe other ones that you know about, right? The, the thing is, those also create a sense of, are we also creating too much debt on people? Are we, are we, do we have the right box around these not to create a bubble that mm -hmm. can bring financial system down again? Yeah. Because why am I saying this is uh, sometimes when you create these new things, you might build up, for example, BNPL, which mm -hmm. I always have a question in my mind is we're giving this BNPL for so many people, but are we really checking if they can actually pay? Mm -hmm. Because usually I'm probably all from an older generation, but 15 years ago, if you wanted to take money, you have to fill papers, you go to the bank, you tell them I want this, they'll do a credit check, blah, blah, blah. You have a credit score. It takes a lot of time to get money. And then now it seems to be something like on the spot. You just press a button and just, okay, you can pay this in four times. Great, I'll take it. And then I'll, I'll go away. So I don't know if all these value added services in general probably are a good thing, but are we creating some sort of a risk also? So maybe let me break this down for you in a couple of uh, in a couple of buckets. So first of all, you have the proper value added services in the sense that we use it at Mastercard at least, where we, for instance, say today, let's say you're transacting, right? You take your phone and you're transacting at the point of uh, mm. at the point of sale. Now, for you to be able to transact, your phone is going to ask you for a biometric check. Correct. Now that uses Mastercard technology on the iPhone. Okay. So when you do that, that for us is value added services. Okay. Obviously, it's not a free service. Yeah. Somebody's paying for it somewhere down in the value chain. And you get the benefit of making sure that nobody hacks your card on your phone. Correct. So for us, that's a value added service. It's a service that adds value, assures the transaction, make it easier. You don't have to like enter a pin like the olden days, you know, and touch a POS machine that 16,000 people have touched on the same day. Correct. So this is for us a proper value added services. And our value added services, we kind of split them between, you know, pre transaction, during transaction, and post transaction. Okay. And you know, there's many examples, right? So analytics is one whereby, whereby for instance, sometimes you'll be uh, you know, shopping around for something and your bank or your merchant will make a recommendation for you. That for us is part of, for instance, we just acquired a company that, that did that for McDonald's for many years. Actually, it was built by McDonald's, it's called uh, Dynamic Yield. Okay. And the idea for them is if you're actually standing at the checkout at the McDonald's, based on what you're ordering, they can guess what would be a great uh, next a suggestion for that basket Great. based purely on what you're ordering, right? <laughs> Great. And and actually it works even better when you're if you're at the McDonald's on the on the screens, you know, on the kiosk, you, yeah, one, on the kiosk yeah. what they have discovered, which will not be a surprise when I tell you, is that people will order more and will order less healthy when they are by themselves at the screen. Of course, because, because there's no, <laughs> no shame, pressure. no shame factor, right? So right. there's no shame, and you're kind of like in your own corner. You get to be, you know, little dirty old, old you versus in front of a, you know, lady asking you, "Would you like to have ice cream?" You're probably gonna be like, "Ah, no, I'm trying to be healthy." <laughs> okay. So I'll have the double cheeseburger with the diet coke on the side. But if you're like at the at the, at the sort of self service uh, uh, digital kiosk, I think you're you're much more prone to make more mistakes. So, but these are the sort of behavioral economics and behavioral decision making tools and analytics that we make. I mean, obviously not for you to get fatter, but we make available to all our our uh, partners for you to to be able to, uh, as an organization, inform your customers about other choices or relevant choices or decisions based on tons of data analytics. So that is for us value added services. Another uh, type of value added services is for instance, cybersecurity. Right. Right. So if, like I said, like you're paying with your iPhone or sometimes now if you're buying, I know your tickets on real or on Vox, you, uh, you know, you, you, you kind of uh, put in your MasterCard and then suddenly there's an ID check yeah, to make the, sure that this is you. The 3D ID check. Yes, yeah, so the 3D is correct. That is also a MasterCard technology that ensures that it is you transacting, correct. not your son without your permission or etc. So, and then there's X, you know, post transaction or general kind of uh, services that we provide, and and it cuts across the whole value chain. For us, this is value added services. Now, I think the second bucket you refer to is more along the lines of, um, um, I would say, use cases uh, or technologies that enable new use cases to solve for a certain problem, maybe, I'm mm -hmm. not sure actually yeah. sometimes. <laughs> uh, and then they could have, uh, obviously, you know, when you create new opportunities, you also create new risks. Of and course. you gave a good example, which is BNPL. Now, the opportunity is for BNPL, that, the way we see it at least is, and we have a big BNPL program that we're rolling out, you know, in, in five global markets this year, including the UAE. <clears throat> and we have another, uh, I think, five or six markets for next year as well. 
globally, uh, where we say, for instance, we believe that BNPL is a product that is better fit for less financially included demographics. Okay. Right. So it's not a product maybe for like white collar, uh, you know, individuals uh, or engineers or consultants or whatever. Uh, this is more for like, you know, labor, let's say, or blue collar worker at a store that doesn't even have a bank account or has a bank account, but never has access to credit. Right. And now, you know, they're faced with a decision whereby they have to buy a necessity, right? Um, it could be a household item or an appliance. Right. But, you know, getting the funding for that, which would be irrelevant for somebody who's a white collar, it would be very relevant for them. Of course. And because this is a necessity, odds are, because this is their first time that getting a loan, that they will treat it very conscientiously and responsibly. Okay. So if you're, if you're out there by using BMPL to buy pizza, probably not a very you know, conscious decision. Yeah. And whoever is extending that limit to you should have thought about it. <laughs> right? and that's their own risk. If a firma cannot tell that you're going to buy a pizza with you know, $10 worth of BMPL, this is a problem. Versus going to buy, I don't know, a TV for 200 bucks. Right. Probably you're going to pay it back. Now, there's not just about what you're buying, it's also who you are. And there is a ton of analytics that happen behind the background that a lot of people don't see. And not necessarily in the traditional way of, hey, send me your salary certificate, send me your this, that, the other. It's purely about, can I identify you? So KYC, mm. and that is one of the value added services we provide at MasterCard. And we have many you know, partners that do it like SignZ or others. ID was they're doing it now, for instance, in the in GCC. And then they say, okay, I can identify who this customer is. Based on that, can I look at their social network? Are they close to their friends? Wow. So then we start, it's called behavioral scoring. And we start sc scoring you on the behavioral, uh, let's say, traits uh, and, and, and criteria that we know constitute a good, credit worthy customer versus an irresponsible person who's going to not pay, right? Does, do they have, how many, how many utility bills do they have? Uh, how many are being paid on time? How many friends do they have? How many are they in touch with regularly? What kind of profiles are they? So there's a lot, I mean, tons of behavioral data that you don't see that gets scored in real time that churns out a score that says, I'm likely to give that person 200 bucks to buy a TV versus I don't want to give that person And does bucks. this happen in the second you're exactly. trying to yes. press and the button? In a few seconds, to be fair, yes. Wow, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit scary, yeah, to be it honest. Is, it is. <laughs> but that's the power of data, right? I mean, that's why we say data is a new oil. I mean, the, the whole point of it is you know, there's no value added services without data. Wow, okay. Yeah. But then, uh, obviously, there's always a risk, uh, even if you take the, the, the but at the end, there's it's a percentage of risk, like how, how big, how risky the, it is. On the portfolio, and on the portfolio. Yeah. if three people default, if three percent of the people default, I think you're, you're in pretty good. Correct, areas. correct. Even if it goes up to usually like it's under 10%, but somewhere between 7 and 10%, 6 and 10% for a BNPL portfolio is still good because anyway, also the yields are higher. Uh, and in the end, it's the merchant that's willing to pay them because they're creating new sales for them. So the merchant is paying typically for the extra cost of credit, not the the consumer themselves. Okay. So it's a win-win. How about a bit crypto, right? Yeah. Crypto came and, you know, claimed to be... Came and went. Came. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, I didn't. <laughs> that's, a I skeptic. Mean, that's a skeptic me. But I mean, uh, it, it, I mean, I mean, we've been talking about crypto for now, I think 10 years, if, yeah. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, since the early days. Yeah, and, you know, there was hypes going up and down, replacements of payments. Yeah. It will be the new thing. And we keep talking about it every time, every few years. We yeah. keep pushing the boundaries more and more. There's even, I mean, as, a, as an e-commerce, we've seen also uh, tools where you can accept now crypto as a payment, right? You can put a new claim, people get excited. I can, you can pay me with crypto. Like, NFTs, okay, but what am I do with that. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do I do with the crypto? Uh, is, is this something that, in your perspective, I mean, do you think this is something that's sticking or another hype that there's no... Look, I mean, there's if, no stickiness to it. If I had a dollar for every time somebody told me, "Oh, crypto's here. You guys are you're gonna have a Kodak moment," you know, I, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be well off right now. <laughs> and, right. and and not because I'm skeptical, but it's also because I think I don't think people appreciate the complexity of the financial services matrix that I referred to at the beginning. It is very complex. We have 90 million merchants today that accept payments. You cannot create 90 million, you know, points of acceptance overnight. Correct. So to your point and your question, what is the use of crypto? I mean, I don't know, unless I can use it for something beyond just saving and staking, which is kind of, you know, interesting because right. it's like saying, yeah. let's all agree that there's something that's value X and let's all stake it so that whoever the next guy comes in, we make X plus Y. I mean, tokenomics, interesting. And I have a lot of my friends who kind of like gave me a lot of grief for not believing in it earlier. And I still kind of like question it. I think the real question is, we need to think about 
And we need to ask ourselves, is crypto a solution looking for a problem or does it solve for anything? Right now, I think in my mind, and when I talk to our chief innovation officer, for instance, about his perspective on crypto, and it's interesting to see how it's changed over time. Initially, he was a bit more bullish about it. Now he's kind of like trying to kind of box it into, could it be useful for loyalty? Yeah. Could it be used as tokens in yes. Web3? Yeah, that's what that's what lately I've been yeah. hearing. Is it better associated with gaming? Right. Then, you know, okay, then then is it is it a currency anymore? Probably not. How is it different than Emirates Skywards, uh, Miles? I don't know. How is it different than Etihad uh, points? I don't know. So we'll have to think about also the evolution of tokens in general, what we call loyalty points. So I think right. of them as tokens in general. And the evolution of payment, uh, let's say, form factors, like cards are also being tokenized. So there's kind of, look, there is a, a grander scheme of things where things are kind of merging towards tokenization. Okay. But does it mean that crypto is going to be the new currency? Probably not. We've seen how regulators reacted to crypto initially. Of course. And how, ma- how, how many of them vehemently regulated against it, uh, warned against it. Some regulators on the other front obviously went all for it, like what happened, I think, in Salvador. Salvador, where, where, yeah. Wherever they turned the whole economy and said, okay, well, we don't care about dollars anymore. Well, good luck buying anything. So, so I think there is, there's going to be all kinds of ebb and flow around this. There's going to be all kinds of booms and busts. I don't think that we've seen the end of crypto. It's too soon to say, oh, you know, crypto's here and now it's gone. I think over time, crypto is going to be sized down to its real use case and the real value it can create if it can create for the economy. And right. it may not be for the physical economy, not even for the digital economy. It probably will be only for the digital economy. Okay. Right. And until we can figure out seamless, and we're working on it, honestly, we are trying really hard to work with all of the crypto players on on ramp, off ramp type of use cases. But again, acceptance, the volatility, the risk. We, we, I mean, when we talk to banks about whether they're willing, their treasurers are willing to take some of those risks, there's a lot of hesitation. So jury's still out. We still are yet to see where this is going to land. I think this is kind of a plane being built as it's uh, being flown at the same time, so to speak. So I, 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 I will not sort of... Uh, uh, rain down on crypto as <laughs> the same way the, the crypto people rain, rain down on us. But I'll say the jury's still out and it'll be interesting to see how it evolves into something more useful and relevant. Good. Okay. So um, talking about kind of going back to the first thing we were talking about is e-commerce and the rise and exploding. Ob- obviously, this has a big impact on environment, the planet, the et planet, yep. etc. What do you think about this? Like, what is what is something we're trying to do to make to minimize the impact? Look, that's a great question. And I think we're looking at it on multiple levels, right? So uh, maybe let me just break those down to you. Um, MasterCard has you know, made a huge commitment in terms of ESG, for instance, to be carbon neutral by 2040 or zero, uh, zero carbon footprint by 2040. Uh, and, and then we have kind of derived streams to support that vision, right? Of, of a world beyond cash, but also that's zero, uh, zero uh, carbon footprint. So the way we wanna do it is uh, tackle every part of the value chain and help as much as we can. Um, and I'll give you two or three examples of how that, how that comes to life. So first of all, for instance, we've started really promoting our uh, sustainable uh, plastic, which, made, which is made from recyclable plastic. So that's the first thing, which I think is an obvious one since right. we're in the plastic <laughs> business. But also beyond the plastic where we do you know, invisible payments, like I said before, in e-commerce. So we are working with many of our partners who are really dabbling into Web3 and trying to explore how they can monetize or create better experiences with Web3, for instance. So some of the, of the merchants and some of the, the acquiring partners that we are working with are looking at exploring how they can minimize return through Web3. So for instance, when you're trying to buy, I don't know, a dress for your wife, instead of uh, you know getting her something, her getting surprised, now she doesn't like it, she wants to return it and get the other one of the other color. Now you can you know maybe get a bit more uh, intimate with what it would look like by just putting on your Web3 goggles or going onto a certain a sort of uh, you know uh, desktop environment and really try to um, visualize what that dress or that product, whatever it is, that shoe looks like so that you don't have to you know, have a surprise uh, delivery and not like the product and return it and create uh, you know, additional carbon footprint. Because logistics already has its own carbon footprint. So the question is, how do you minimize? How do you Correct. reduce returns and so on? Uh, so I think that's another way to doing it. Another way we're also doing it is we have uh, launched a new uh, PPC platform as we call it. So Priceless Planet, 
uh, a kind of uh, a platform. And the whole idea about it is uh, coalition. So the coalition, PPC, Price Hispanic Coalition, is we work with a number of NGOs globally and we help them, um, you know, either for instance, so we go to our banks and say, hey, your loyalty points are useful. How about we turn them into, you know, you as a customer now, let's say you're buying something, the app will inform you, oh, you bought, I'm making this up, right? You bought a, uh, a um, I don't know, a fridge and a fridge has X, this fridge has X, uh, you know, uh, carbon footprint uh, impact. You can redeem so many loyalty points to plant a tree somewhere else to offset that carbon footprint. Okay. So that technology, we, we acquired this company called, or we're partnering with a company called Duconomy out of Sweden who does that. So they help you score your purchase is based on the merchant. So let's say if you uh, if you travel somewhere, it'll tell you how much you know it costs Carbon. because of the number of miles you travel. If you bought from a supermarket, you know based on the size of the basket, it tells you what's the, the the carbon footprint score. And then using the bank loyalty points, then you can redeem yourself in a way, right? And 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 buy uh, offsets uh, or support those NGOs in planting trees or right. you know cleaning the coral reef, whatever it is to kind of offset your your behavior, Correct. which is a very relevant way if you think about it today if you look at your children my children definitely my son comes back home and he's really upset about what's happening in the oceans i'm like you've never been to an ocean more than a couple of times <laughs> so so that conscientiousness and that awareness is now much more readily available in the conscious mind especially of the younger segments Correct. and these kind of solutions they speak to them because you help them connect what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis with their impact on the planet and give them solutions to help them themselves redeem it anyway so these are two or three examples of how uh, how Mastercard is really involved uh, very, in, in this whole. Very, I mean, uh, all companies obviously sustainability is a huge. very, very, very huge Absolutely. topic now. Especially with, COP twenty eight coming next year, right? So we all got to be on top of it, right? Of course, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, they're coming here. <laughs> they're coming in the region next year, of course. Good. Uh, well, listen. Thank you very much for being our guest today. Thank you for having a, me. It was a very, very interesting conversation. Thank you. And uh, on that note, thank you everyone for joining us for another episode and see you next time. Uh -huh.